Hello Longhorns and welcome to our October lunchtime lecture. Because we're discussing politics today, I wanted to make sure you know about Longhorns on the Hill, which is happening on October 26. This is our annual advocacy event at the federal level, and you can register today at texasx.org slash L-O-T-H. Join us from your home, office, or home office to virtually meet with members of Congress and share the impact of your UT Austin education. We hope to see you there. And for those of you who made a donation when you registered for this event, thank you. We couldn't do all the amazing things we do at the X's, including this event, without your support. Now, on to today's virtual event, a lecture called Politics as Usual, an early look at the 2022 midterms. Our guest today is a University of Texas distinguished teaching professor in the government department and is one of our university's experts on the topic of con congressional decision making. He is the author of five books and numerous articles and is currently researching the effect of interpersonal relationships within the U.S. Congress. His classes include the U.S. Congress, congressional elections, party polarization in the United States, and the politics of the Catholic Church. And he has won a number of the biggest teaching awards given on campus. Please welcome Professor Sean Theriol. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. A warm introduction, and I'm so ple so pleased to be with you all. So first, I'm so sorry that I'm late. At the very last minute, my computer decided I needed to update Microsoft Teams, and by the time I downloaded and I logged in, it was right. It's it's the end of a really difficult year and eight months, and I'm sure I don't need to explain any of that to you all. Um, and before we get to the the slide on the on the presentation, let me just also add my thanks. Uh, I've been at the University of Texas for almost 20 years, and I couldn't do what I do unless if all of you did what you do. Um, I, I have had the great fortune of traveling with over 350 students to, to Washington, D.C. I've taken almost 100 students to Rome through my politics of the Catholic Church class. And, and because of everything that you've done to give me the space to do what it is that I want to do, I think we've made a great combination. And so thank you from the bottom of my heart for both giving me the opportunity and my students the opportunity to, to just really live the motto of the University of Texas, which truly is what starts here changes the world. And, and I'm not so braggadocious to think that we're changing the world, but what I'm absolutely certain is that we are changing the lives of students. And to me, that's much more important. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And so from the really positive message tonight, this slide, right? We're 391 days away until the 2022 elections. And I know that it feels like we just got through the 2020 election and the inauguration, but I think it's really helpful for us to have an eye on what's likely to happen over the course of the next, right? It's 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 more than a year, but it's not much more than a year. And so what I hope to do today is just to provide you with a little bit of context to understand what it is that we're likely to see over the next, right, 54 weeks. Yeah, a little, yeah, 50, maybe 55 weeks, between 54 and 55 weeks. And so as we're thinking about the 2022 elections, I want to start with the two most important factors, right? And so this is on the next slide. So the first most important factor is that incumbents win. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know, but right, if you're a student in, in one of my Congress classes or congressional elections, the, on the first day I write this expression on the board, which is MOC equals SMSR. So members of Congress are single-minded single seekers of re-election. And what ends up happening is they're really good at seeking re-election. Um, and so if we start off with the premise that most of those who seek re-election will gain re-election, then we'll understand, let's say, 75% of the results that we're likely to see in 54 weeks. The second thing that we need to think about is that the president's party loses seats. Um, and we'll, we'll dive into both of these kind of big, broad, important factors. Um, but if we start off with that premise, then we'll understand a lot. So going first, right, if we look at, at the incumbency win rates across time, we'll see that in the House of Representatives, even in 2020, which we think of as being a really unusual year, even 2018, which is even more unusual, in that lots of members of Congress lost their seats. And when I say lots, right, it's still the case that more than 90% of them won re-election in the House of Representatives. And over 90% of them uh, won re-election to the Senate. So of course we see 
that uh, there are some elections where, especially Senate incumbents, so if we go back to 1980, the year in which Ronald Reagan was reelected, there are lots of Democrats that lost their seat. Right in 2006, lots of Republicans lost their seats. And right, if we go back all the way to 1968, right, uh, there are lots of, of, of senators that lost their seats. But even when I say lots, it's still, right, less than 30% of the people that were running for reelection ultimately were unsuccessful. But let's look at the House a little bit more particularly uh, when we think about the president's party losing seats. And so, right, what this chart shows you is from 1950 to 2018 um, in the midterm elections, right? So these are in between the presidential elections. Uh, the president's party typically loses seats. Uh, so if we go back to 1950, right, the Democrats were in control um, and uh, their party lost 28 seats. Eisenhower, when he wins in 1952, his party lost 19 seats in his first midterm election and then 49 seats in a second midterm election. And so we see across that broad sweep, like look at especially at 1994 and 2010, right? Barack Obama and, and uh, Bill Clinton, their party lost 52 seats. Bill Clinton's party did in 1994. And then Barack Obama's party lost 63 seats in 2010. But we see that there are uh, first, right, I guess the, the average, right? So if you look at the average number of seats lost, right, that's 24.6. So I highlight this if, if you click one, one arrow forward, right, it'll highlight that 24.6. And so, right, on average, the president's party loses 25 seats, right? And think about the small margin right now in the House of Representatives, right? Nancy Pelosi can't lose three or four votes on any given vote or the Democrats won't have enough. And so if 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 they lose, lose 24 seats, then her party is not only gonna be a minority party, but it's gonna be a minority party by, by about 35 or, or 40 members. But there are two exceptions. And I think that those exceptions are really helpful for us to think about as we have our eye towards 2022, right? So those two exceptions are in 1998 and 2002 which I highlight, right, by clicking it one more. There we go, right? So in 1998, the Democrats actually gained four seats, right? So remember, this is Bill Clinton running right after the House impeaches, but before the Senate takes a vote on conviction. And what the American public thought at that point was that the Republicans were pushing too hard against uh, the Democratic president. And so they rewarded the Democratic president by giving his party four additional seats. Mind you, this wasn't enough for, to give the Democrats a majority, but it did make the margin smaller in the House of Representatives. And then if we think about 2002, I think there's another really important lesson, right? So this is the first midterm election of George W. Bush's presidency. This is 14 months after the September 11th attacks on the United States. The American public largely thought that President George W. Bush did a good job in helping the Americans and the United States government through that really tumultuous time. And so his party was rewarded with seats. Right, so the two lessons that we can take away from this is, right, first, don't overplay your hand, right? So Republicans, like, right, there are, there are just a few seats, uh, but if you overplay your hand, then the American public might reward Joe Biden's party. And then the second is that if the Democrats govern well, just as the Republicans did after the 2000, uh, 2001 attacks, then their party could be rewarded. Right, so generally the president's party loses seats, but I think those two exceptions that we've experienced over the last 60 years or so are really uh, important for us to remember as we start thinking about the 2022 cycle. Right, so looking at the House of Representatives again, remember that that margin is so small right now. Right, so the Democrats have a majority by six, seven seats. It depends how many vacant seats there are, how many special elections we have to go. And we see that that's tiny by just our, our most immediate path. But then look at the broad sweep, the, right, those, those huge Democratic majorities that they experienced from 1952 all the way through the 1990s. And so as we think about the House elections, I want us to have some considerations in mind. So if we think about the 2022 House elections, some of the other things that we need to think about beyond that the, uh, members of Congress are single-minded seekers of re-election um, and that they're largely successful in doing that and that the president's party loses seats, here are some other things that we need to consider. The first thing that we need to consider is presidential popularity. So how is President Biden faring these days? If we ask the question, do you approve or disapprove of the way that President Biden is handling his job, when we asked the American public this, according to the last Gallup poll, we find that 43% of Americans approve of the way the president is doing his job and 53% 
disapprove of how the president is doing his job, right? So in in, in thinking about and, and narrowing this down, so if we take 43 minus 53, we find out that Joe Biden is now 10 points below that break-even point, right? So 43 minus 53 equals minus 10. And so we see that if we look across his, uh, since he was inaugurated, right, he started where he was 20 points above right, that break-even point, and now he's 10 points below. So he's lost 30 points kind of in net approval. And we see that he's gone down. And so you think, oh, Joe Biden is, 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 is just a horrible president, and, and it's indicated by his 30-point loss. But if we look at the presidents around him, we see that this like reduced popularity is not that unusual, right? So even on the day that John Donald Trump was elected president, right, he was at the break even point. And by the time we get to this point in his presidency, right, he's at minus 20, right? So it's, it's only went down 20 points, but nonetheless, he was less popular today in his presidency than Joe Biden is today in his presidency. And even Barack Obama, right, on the day that he's inaugurated president, he had a net approval of almost 60 points. But at this point in his presidency, it had gone down to 20 points net approval, which means that his had gone down almost 40 points, right? So not as much or even more, I should say, uh, than Joe Biden. And if we think about it, right, it's not that Donald Trump and, and Barack Obama are at all unusual. If we go back in time, right, we see that George W. Bush, right, had that huge spike after September 11th, but then kind of went down. And, and on the day that he's inaugurated or um, faces re-election, which is way over on the right hand side, we see that it is approximately at the same place that uh that um, Barack Obama was. And then if we go back a president to Bill Clinton, we see that he was even more popular when he was reelected, but he even less popular uh, than Joe Biden at points, although right, he had had that uptick. right? So for those of you that were around in the early 1990s and, and, and paying particular attention to politics, right, that low point, that dip in, in Bill Clinton, right, that was when he had his hair cut on the runway in LA by Kristoff. I don't know if any of you remember that, but at that point, Americans had just had enough of Bill Clinton, at least at that point. Right, he rebounds, and by the time he faces re-election, he's he's pretty popular uh, once again. And then going back further in time, if you go back to George H. W. Bush's term, right, his big spike comes after the Persian Gulf War, but then his depths go way deeper. Um, and in fact, he doesn't reach that break-even point by the time he's re-elected. And then I'm sorry that I'm giving you so much data here, right? If we go back to Ronald Reagan, we see that his popularity is even greater than Bill Clinton's on the day that he faces re-election. And if we go to Jimmy Carter, we see that Jimmy Carter is very much in the territory of uh, George H.W. Bush. And so if we average all the presidents across their first term in office, we get this nice big black line uh, that tells us, right? And so Joe Biden is doing worse than presidents, uh, than the average president at this point. Um, but but he's still uh, not as bad as as Donald Trump, who is who is who is even lower. The really interesting phenomenon, though, about presidential popularity across time is how different it is now than it was in the Ronald Reagan and uh, Bill Clinton or George H. W. Bush era, even. Right. So this is right I, again. I'm sorry for the confusion here, but right that that bold region in the middle that is one standard deviation away from their average approval across time. And so if we start over with Carter, what it means is that the opinion on Carter had great variation, right? So there are times where he's really popular, there are times where he was really unpopular. And then that lightly shaded blue region is from the lowest point, right, at the bottom to the highest point of his popularity, right? And so it gives the whole range of his popularity across time. And we see that the American public's opinion about Ronald Reagan was a little bit more um, precise than it, can, uh, than it was with, with uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, but then look at George H.W. Bush, right? Remember how popular he was after the Persian Gulf War and then how unpopular he was when he was seen uh, on his speedboat in kind of Bunkport, Maine amid the, the recession, right? So his, his uh, right popularity very, uh, varied much more. And then we see that Bill Clinton was a little bit more constricted, George, uh, George W. Bush, um, right? Less constricted than his father, Barack Obama. And then look at Donald Trump and Joe Biden. I think those two are so interesting. What it says is that right now we are so um, set on what our, our, our feelings are about the president that even if Donald Trump had walked on water, there's still 40% of Americans that would never approve of the job that he's doing. And, and, and even if, if if Joe Biden did something horrible, right, like there are still 40% uh, of Americans who are going to approve of the job that he's doing. It, it means that we're so ingrained in, in our approval of or disapproval of the president these days that even if they do great things or horrible things, it just doesn't change that much. 
And I think that we see this really vividly in the next slide, where we break down the approval of Joe Biden at three different points of his presidency, right? So that first bar is the approval of the president on the day that he was inaugurated. So only 11% of Republicans approved of him on the day that he was inaugurated versus 98 percent of Democrats, right? All the Democrats were thrilled on the day of his inauguration. Independents were about 61 percent approving of, of the way that, uh, that Joe Biden uh, did his job on inauguration. And then if we go to June, right? So June, he was still relatively popular. There had been a little bit of slippage among independents, a slight slippage among Democrats. Republicans were still at the same point. But then look, after we have the Afghanistan, after we've had chaos on the border, after we have him telling us about boosters that the FDA ends up not endorsing, right? The, that independent number has come way down. It's 37%, right? It's gone down 24 points among independents. And it's because he did about 20 points better among independents on election day, he became president. And so if that 37% were solid for Joe Biden, if he were facing re-election today, it would, be, it would be grim for him. But let's compare Biden's numbers to Trump's numbers, right? So this, these are Trump's numbers at three different points of his presidency, right? The first column is on the day that he was inaugurated. The second column is on the day of his midterm election, right? So that would be 2018, November. And then that third is on the day that he faced his own reelection, right? So that would be, of course, November of 2020. And what we see is that uh, Republicans were a little bit less approving on the day that he faced reelection. Um, Democrats, right, at 4%. And then, right, the independents, look at how he had the support of 42% of them. Uh, on the day that he was inaugurated, and then it slips all the way to 30%. And just that difference in that 12 points tells us a whole lot about why Donald Trump ended up losing the presidency. And I think that's uh, really insightful for us to think about. Now this next, uh, right, there are going to be lots of numbers on this next slide, and I'll only stay here for a second, but this tells us, right, the president's popularity on the next slide tells us the president's popularity on the day of the uh, midterm elections and then how many seats their party lost. Right, so right, Democrats, Republicans, like look at that for a second. But then in the next one, I show you the XY plot, which I think is much more helpful. And what that shows is there's basically a, right, a positive trend. So the more popular a president is, then their party may actually pick up seats. And so if we run a rough, uh, rough regression line through that, we'll get this trend line that shows that indeed there is a positive correlation and it's about 0.55, right? So perfect would be one, uh, no relationship would be zero. So it's partway in the middle. So if we then show in the next slide, where Joe Biden is today at that minus 10. And it looks like that his party on average, right, if that trend line is accurate, could lose almost 40 seats, right? So when you're only talking about a six or seven seat margin in the House of Representatives, it suggests that the Democrats are going to lose a whole lot of seats. But we're a year out from the election. So a lot can change over the next year. So the first consideration that I want us to think about was presidential popularity. The second consideration I want us to think about is redistricting. What we know with redistricting, right, states are doing it now, um, is that, right, in this, uh, this map shows you which party is in control. Look at all that red on that map, right? So almost entirely throughout the South, the Republicans have unified control over who determines what the district lines are gonna look like. You can't be su surprised if Republicans are in control of the process, that they're gonna draw lines that are helpful to the Republican party, right? And, and then the next biggest color on this map is gold, right? Gold is commissions. Right, so we think of commissions as kind of being those neutral umpires, if you will, at drawing lines that basically reflect the, the partisanship of the state. And then and the next color on the map um, are, are maybe the gold, right? So the gold is where there's split, uh, no, I'm sorry, gold is commissions, right? So the next one is maybe blue, maybe purple. So purple is where there's split control, right? So right now, Louisiana has a Democratic governor, uh, but a Republican legislature. So it is Pennsylvania with a Democratic governor, Republican legislature, Wisconsin the same, Minnesota the same, Maine the same, Connecticut the same, right? And then we see, right, those few states where the Democrats have control of the process, right? So Massachusetts, which already has a unified Democratic coalition, uh, um, uh, uh, sends uh, all Democrats to Congress. Maryland, which only has one Republican. Illinois sends a few more Republicans to the House Representatives. And then Oregon uh, in, in, in Nevada. But what this map shows you is that the Democrats don't have control of the process in very many states, and, and that's going to be to their disadvantage. 
But if you're looking for the good side of this is the Democrats weren't uh, in control in very many other states in the 2010 cycle. And so in 2010, the map basically looked like this. And so Republicans already have created as many seats as they possibly could have. And so we'll see how much better they can do after the 2020 cycle than they can do after the 2010 cycle. Other considerations that we're thinking about, right? Democrats uh, have to get many more votes. Um, just because of the way the districts are configured, just because of the way the Democrats like to live near other Democrats, it's really hard for Democrats to gerrymander very successfully. Um, and so, right, if we look at right now the trial heat, right, so would you be more likely to vote for a Democrat or Republican? The Democrats have a two percentage point lead. And you would think that, all right, so they're doing better on average than the Republicans, but yet these numbers aren't gonna be particularly helpful if we think of how votes translate into seats. And so to understand that and appreciate that a little bit better, on the next slide, we show how many votes the Democrats received, which is that that, that striped column. So in 2012, they received 51% of the votes but only 46% of the seats. And of course, all of you know that it doesn't matter how many votes you get, it matters how many seats you get. So they're still a minority party. In 2014, they got 47% of the votes, but only 43% of the seats. 2016, right, that's still that five point gap. 2018, they do a little bit better, right? So they get 54% of the, of the, of the votes and about 54% of the seats. And, and, and part of the reason we know this is because the Republicans were gerrymandering a lot of these districts. They never anticipated the huge wave that would have happened in 2020. And so a lot of those really uh, seats that they thought that they were going to win by five or six points ended up flipping to the Democrats, right? Two of those uh, right here in Texas, right? So there was a district in, in, in Houston where Lizzie Fletcher won. And then there's the district up in, in Dallas where Cullen Allred won. And, and, and they weren't, uh, those were never supposed to be Democratic districts, but because the wave was so big. Right in 2020, they got 52% of the votes, but only 51% of the seats. And so we know that the Democrats are going to have to overperform. Are they going to have to overperform 5%, 6%, 3%? We're not sure. And so if you're a Democrat, you sure want that generic congressional trial heat to, to be trending more like five, six, seven points before you would start feeling a little bit more comfortable. Other considerations uh, for the House of Representatives. The next one is that we have a shifting electorate. And so what I mean by a shifting electorate, right? So if we just hit the, the uh, space bar one time or the arrow, um, right, the shifting electorate. So what, that'll, what that means is that we know that less educated voters these days are more likely to vote for the Republican candidate. That's a change from, from the past, right? This is something that Donald Trump introduced into American politics. And so what we know is, um, is that, uh, right, the lower propensity voters these days are likely to be Republican voters. Um, because they're lower educated. And so we'll see that the way that this plays out uh, in the uh, in the election. Uh, the next other consideration is that we know that Democrats can raise money. Um, it, it, there is a, right, I, I'm going to make a bold statement here, and I think that it's at least 99.9% .9 true. There is not a single Democratic candidate that lost in 2020 because they didn't have enough money. Right, Democrats were investing in all sorts of crazy elections. Right, they thought they could knock off Mitch, Mc knock off Mitch McConnell, and so the person running against Mitch McConnell, Amy McGrath, she had like more than fifteen million dollars. Right, Susan Collins had almost twenty million dollars run against her, and yet Susan Collins still won in Maine. So the Democrats are not going to have a problem raising money. Uh, it, they certainly didn't in 2020. I doubt that they will in uh, 2022. And so that's a, a new phenomenon in American politics. We don't expect Democrats to really be that well funded, but we know, uh, right, if 2018 and 2020 is any indication that their candidates are going to have every dollar that they're going to need to run, whether or not that's going to be enough to actually pull out some of these races, we'll see. Uh, the next consideration I want us to think about uh, is that the Republicans learned that they can run with good candidates, right? So the seats that the Republicans were able to win in the 2020 election weren't these, right, these, these Trump kind of candidates in these moderate districts, but rather the Republicans had chosen candidates that were very well suited for their districts, right? If we think about some of those districts in Southern Cal uh, Southern Florida, right? They had chosen, right, these, these telegenic uh, uh, um, Hispanic women who, right, one of them was, was on TV as a newscaster, right? She was not 
trumping the Trump message, if you will, but rather she was talking about those common sense, basic Republican principles, and she was able to knock off right a Democratic incumbent. And so if the Republicans choose carefully in these more moderate districts, then they recognize that they won. But where they, where they chose Trump candidates in these moderate districts, they didn't do nearly as well. And so Republicans uh, should hang on to this lesson as they start thinking about how the votes that they're going to cast in these Republican primaries that are going to be occurring here over the next six or seven months. So that's the House. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the Senate. And I think this is really helpful to understand what's happening in the Senate these days. So if we look at the 2022 party vote in the states uh, in the 2020 election, right? So this is Biden versus Trump. So if we go way over to the left-hand side, we see that in the most Democratic state, Joe Biden won almost 70% of the vote. In the next most Democratic state, he won about 66, 67 percent of the vote. And then we see that it slips down in the 60s and then in the 50s. And when we get up way over to the right hand side, we see that in the most Republican state, he's only getting about 30 percent of, uh, of the vote in those states. So which senators represent these states is depicted on the next chart. And so what you see is that there's almost a complete separation, right? So in almost every single Democratic state, there's Democratic senators. And in almost every single Republican state, there are Republican senators, right? So right, your, 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 your eye immediately goes over to that right column, uh, the left column, the, the red column on the left-hand side, right? That's, that's Susan Collins, right? So she's still representing a, a state that voted for Joe Biden at about 55%. And then your eye next most immediately goes to those three bars over on the Republican side, right? So if we go way over to the right-hand side, guess who that is, right? You all know who that is. That's Joe Manchin, right? Joe Manchin, a Democratic senator in a state that, that Joe Biden got 30% of the vote. If you want to have any kind of understanding of what's happening today in the Senate when they're talking about these, these $3.5 trillion bills and you're wondering why Joe Manchin gets that stage to talk about these sorts of things, it's because he's that bar. He represents the second most Republican state in the country. And so, right, we can't be surprised that he's gumming up the works, if you will, of what Chuck Schumer is trying to accomplish, right? And then if we go over a little bit more, the next one is John Tester in Montana. And then the one that's basically in the middle, uh, that is um, Sherrod Brown in Ohio, right? And then you see those other, right, those split delegations, if you will, right, uh, in, the, in the middle of, of, of the chart. So in the next chart, I show you what seats are up in the Senate, right? So right there are some solid blue seats. There are some solid red seats. And then you see that there are a fair number of seats right there in the middle. Um, and so, right, if we think about uh, the, the, um, uh, the Senate today, um, we see that, right, it, it, it's different. And so, right, I would ask, right, we're going to skip the next slide. And if we could go two slides over, right, to the one that says the Senate in 1974. Right, there we go. Right. And so think about the Senate in 1974. So this is the Senate that may have voted to convict Richard Nixon, right? It never got to conviction because he, he, of course, resigned the presidency instead of facing a trial in the Senate or even impeachment in the House. Right. He he uh, resigns before the House can even impeach. But look at those states and look at how mixed the reds and the blues are. So it's true that in the 1974 in the Senate, the average Democratic senator represented a more Republican state than the average Republican senator, right? I mean, they're very close. But on average, right, these states, right, the, the, the whole idea of who you would vote for at the, at the state level for a Senate seat was just different than it was for who you'd vote for at the presidential level. We had many Southern states uh, who were voting Republican at the presidential level that were sending Democratic senators to the Senate. There were many Northeastern progressive uh, liberal states that were sending Republicans uh, to the Senate. But that trend has almost entirely disappeared. So. Let's let's do a deeper dive into the 2020 uh, 20, uh, 22 Senate elections, right? So the, this next slide shows you that, uh, of course, to be a majority, you need 50 votes. If you're the Democrats, you need 51. If you're Republicans, never forget about Kamala Harris, who's the vice president who cast the tie breaking vote. There are 36 Democrats whose seats just aren't up, right? Some of those faces I'm sure are familiar to you because they ran for president, right? Amy Klobuchar and Elizabeth Warren and Tim Kaine, who is Hillary Clinton's VP nominee. Then we have Maisie Hirono from Hawaii. Uh, uh, of course, Bernie Sanders from Vermont uh, and Kirsten Gillibrand from, from New York. So there are just uh, six of the 36 Democrats whose seats aren't up. 
we know that they're going to be serving in the next Senate, God willing. Right then, there are 30 Republicans who uh, who are uh, going to be serving again, God willing, uh, in the next Senate. Uh, it includes, includes, of course, Roger Wicker. He's down in the lower right hand side. John Barrasso, who's the third serving Republican in the Senate these days. Uh, it also includes, oh, I'm blanking on her name, uh, from Nebraska, um, and then of course our very own uh, Ted Cruz there uh, in the bottom uh, left of the of the right hand side. So. Uh, that is the uh, the the senators who aren't up. If we now next look at uh, the seats that are likely for other party, remember that a lot of those those deep red bars and those deep blue bars, these are the 10 Democrats and the 15 Republicans that will almost assuredly win their reelection, right? And you'll see that I have outlines there of uh, Missouri and Alabama. The reason I have outlines there is because those senators, the Republican senators, have announced their retirement. And so that's going to be an open seat. But even an open seat in Missouri is unlikely to create lots of competition. And so we think that that's a solid seat for the for the uh, Republicans. And however solid Missouri is, we know that Alabama is even more solid, right? And then there are 10 Democrats. Uh, all of these uh, folks have announced their their reelection. Um, and so, right, we have 10 solid seats, right? So we're on, on election night. We're not going to be waiting up past midnight on the election results coming in from Hawaii and whether or not Bre uh, Brian Satz is going to be uh, reelected to his his Senate seat in Hawaii, right? If, if, if we're worried about him, then we're going to be worried about a whole lot of other Democrats um, on election night. So now let's go to the likely seats to both parties. And look at that. There's not a single likely seat at this point, right? So either they're solid or there's a whole lot of competition, which I, I think is going to be really exciting uh, for election night. So now let's go to those leaning seats. So there are four leaning to the Democrats, right? Those two names at the top, you're like, wait a minute, I just saw their photos in the 2020 elections. And indeed you did, right? So they are filling the uh, terms of senators that, um, that uh, announced their retirements or died. Right, so uh, Mark Kelly, uh, he is the bald guy running for a six year term, right? Right now he's just finishing the term of John McCain, who of course uh, passed away a couple of years ago. And so he, he was only elected in 2020 for a two year term, finishing up John McCain's term. And so he's running for a six year term. And then over on the left, right, you see, uh, you see uh, Raphael Warnock, right? So he defeats Kelly Loeffler, who was a replacement for Saxby Chamless, right? So he's now finishing up the Saxby Chamless term. And so again, he needs to run for a six year term. And then uh, you have Masto, uh, Cortez Masto in Nevada and the lower left. And then you have Maggie Hassan, uh, who's running in New Hampshire. And so those are the seats that right now we think are leaning towards the, the Democrats. If you ask me, right, so I'm going by the Cook report here. If you ask me personally, I think those bottom, right, the two women are in a little bit better position than Mark Kelly and Raphael, Raphael Warnock, uh, but not, not too much better. And, and, and I think that that Marco Rubio, right, when we return to the Republicans, I think he's in a more solid position. I, I would put five dollars on him than I would Maggie Hassan uh, as an example. Right. And then Ohio, Rob Portman has announced his retirement. Ohio has always been one of those those classic bellwether states, but Ohio has been trending more and more uh, towards the uh, towards the Republicans lately. So that gives us a three toss ups. Right. And there's our three toss ups. So one, we're waiting every day for Ron Johnson in Wisconsin to announce whether or not he's going to run or not. As of now, he hasn't made an announcement. We think that he's probably going to run, but we're not sure. He hasn't announced it. And even if he does run, I think that that's a toss up. Right. And I think that I'm not entirely sure that the Republicans wouldn't do better with someone other than Ron Johnson. Right. So Ron Johnson is hook, line and sinker with the Trump agenda. He's he's uh, very much kind of a Trumpist candidate. Um, and so, right, I mean, we'll see, right? Joe Biden won Wisconsin by about 10,000 votes. That's not a whole lot. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. I think the Republicans might be able to nominate someone better. I'm not entirely sure they would. Um, and so uh, we'll see what happens uh, if Ron Johnson decides to run for re-election. And then, of course, North Carolina, where Senator Burr has announced his retirement. And so we'll see what, what candidates ultimately win, right? The Democrats were certain they were gonna win uh, in 2020 in North Carolina. They had nominated what they thought was their perfect candidate. And then he utterly failed miserably uh, in the general election, right? He, he was involved in an extramarital affair during the campaign, right? If you're a candidate, I would think that would not be the appropriate time uh, to be having, no time is appropriate to have an extramarital affair, especially when he was on his way to the Senate. Ugh. Uh, and then Pennsylvania, uh, we have um, 
Pat Toomey, who announced his uh, retirement. And again, I think it depends a whole lot on who the Democrats and the Republicans nominate. I, I think that a middle person, right? The other senator is, is, is uh, Senator Casey, a Democrat. He's very moderate, right? And so whichever party I think uh, nominates, the more moderate, but but still uh, charismatic is, is likely uh, to, to do better there. But the really interesting thing about this setup is that those three toss-ups are gonna determine a whole lot. Right. So with those three toss ups, if the Republicans win them, then it's a 50 50 Senate, just as the Senate we have today. Right. So in order for the Republicans to become majority party in the Senate, they need to pick up those three toss ups and then they need to knock off one of those Democrats that we think right now is leaning. Uh, I think right like Raphael Warnock, he's not so safe. Neither is Mark Kelly. So I think there's a chance, but they have to do that. Right. So I think right now, if you're a betting man and, and or a betting woman, I would put money on the Democrats holding the Senate more than I would the Democrats holding the House. And you're like, oh, but it really doesn't matter how Senate those things are pretty irrelevant. They're irrelevant until we talk about confirmation of judges. Right. Think about a Supreme Court vacancies. If the Democrats control the Senate, they don't have to care. Right. They don't have to worry about the House. So, right, I think if you were a Democrat and you got to choose which one of these chambers would you rather have a majority, I think you'd probably choose the Senate, right? And only because, right, I wish I could present to you House state, I can't, because states are right now in the process of redrawing their lines. There's about five states that have redrawn their lines, but we need a whole lot more than that in order to figure out who we think is likely leaning, solid, toss up. Um, and so I'm just gonna have to ask you to, uh, to right to have patience on that right as the states start releasing their maps we'll start putting those uh those seats in in categories and we'll have a better idea but but again right like the, the house is looking pretty tough for the democrats at least at this point so i thought given that i can't talk much about house races i'd end with governor's races right so the democrats have 18 seats that they're trying to hold and right now uh right we think that 15 of them are at least leaning democrat Right, so in Nevada, Wisconsin, Missouri, uh, Michigan, right, some of those same states where we're watching close Senate races, and then look at those toss-ups, right? Think about a poor Democratic governor running for re-election in Kansas, right? So Governor Kelly, uh, we'll see if she can pull it out. Uh, she did four years ago. Uh, Pennsylvania has an open seat, right? Right now, we think that's as, as toss-up as the Senate race. Uh, and then Virginia, right, is open right now. So in less than a month, we'll know. Uh, and so we might, be able to remove that one. And, and we could also remove another one over in that solid D category. You'll see that in New Jersey, Governor Murphy is running for re-election. Right now, he, we, th we still think he's solid, but that Virginia race is awfully close. And it's been so interesting to watch the Republican candidate in that race try and thread the needle between bringing the Trump part of the Republican Party along as well as the Chamber of Commerce. And I think he's been, done a particularly good job, right? So if, if you're bored after this presentation and you want more kind of political juice, just Google some of those debates. I think they're pretty interesting. Running against Terry McAuliffe, right? Great friend of the Clintons. Uh, he had previously served as governor uh, and got in, in Virginia. You can't succeed, succeed yourself. And so he had to stop out for four years. Um, and so now he's running for his old seat. Now let's look, I'll end the presentation by looking looking at those Republican held seats uh, in, uh, in governorships, right? So again, uh, the Republicans have 20 seats. Right now we think that Maryland is probably likely to, to or not likely, it's leaning towards the Democrats, right? Maryland, a very democratic state, but boy is Larry Hogan been a pretty effective governor in, in uh, Maryland. And so we'll see if uh, he his own popularity will be able to help the Republican candidate in that race. And then there's the toss up in Arizona. Again, Mark Kelly is gonna be running for reelection. Arizona, toss up governorship. Uh, and then right, Florida and Georgia, right? Both, uh, boy, has uh, Governor Kemp in Georgia been in the crosshairs of, of Donald Trump? So we'll see, right? And DeSantis has been, right? He's had a pretty con uh, uh, conflictual relationship with Trump, although it seems like they're playing well together now. Uh, we'll see, right? And then of course, right, some of that Ohio and, and Texas, right? Governor Abbott right now is just a likely R. We'll see if Beto jumps in. We'll see if Matthew McConaughey jumps in, right? That his dynamics could largely change. So that's the way I'm seeing the 2022 elections at this point. Uh, at this point, I, I'd just love to hear some of the questions that you all might have uh, for me um, in, in uh, what you think is likely to happen in the 2022 elections. Well, thank you so much for that. A lot of information. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, one, this is a great question. The GOP has done well catering to a far right base. Have the Democrats, uh, or the Democrats, excuse me, failed by refusing to field more staunchly progressive candidates? 
Boy, it's really hard, right? So, right, I think that the, the parties are pretty symmetrical at this point, right? I think that 40, per, uh, let's go 38% and 38, 38% um, of the country is solid Republican, like Trump is Republican. And I would say 38% of the Democratic Party is like Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Democrat. Right. And so then it comes down to, all right, what's going to happen in that middle 24 percent? Right. So if you're one of those people that says, all right, we can go grow those 38 percent. And so we need to nominate candidates that are, are that are of the Trump wing or that are of the Bernie Sanders AOC wing, because the way that we win elections is through driving our turn up numbers up. Uh, and getting people excited to cast votes, uh, then you would agree with with I think the premise behind the 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 questioner uh, that that asked the question. But if you're one of those people that says no, in the United States, the way you win elections is if you appeal to the moderate voters. Uh, then you would say no. What we need to do is we need to take that 38 percent. We need to put that in our hip pocket, and then we need to figure out how we're going to get that last 13 percent that push us over the 50 percent line and the way that we do that is we appeal to moderates we appeal to independents we might even start appealing to some of those republicans or those moderate republicans or moderate democrats that could switch their vote then you would say no we need to go with a candidate that appeals to uh to more moderates so right what we can say is that in the 2018 election it was pretty right we have good evidence that two thirds of the people who supported Democratic candidates in 2018 that did not in 2016 were of those who switched their vote, right? One third of it was mobilization. Two thirds of it were people who previously supported Republican candidates, right? And so that should give us a little bit of an indication that maybe the way that you win elections, especially in those really moderate districts, those moderate states, is not by appealing to the AOC wing or the Trump wing, but rather you start appealing to the Chamber of Commerce if you're a Republican, or you start appealing to the Joe Biden labor Democrats. Um, at least that's what that's what the evidence would tell us from 2018. And what do you think are the chances of a third party becoming viable and in, in the near future? Okay. And given the splits between the both parties and how would that affect the 2022 elections if we had a third party that was viable? Right. And this, again, is such a smart question. Um, and I hope that you'll uh, indulge me in a, just a little bit of my personal, uh, not personal background, but my personal circumstances as of today. So uh, right, I'm, I'm, I'm teaming in, right? Usually I Zoom, but I'm teaming in today uh, from France, right? So I'm teaching a four-week class on party polarization uh, at Sciences Po Lyon. And so, right, I'm, I'm, I'm in France in the questioner is utterly consistent with the French system, right? If we go back four or five years, we can't imagine a candidate like Emmanuel Macron winning the presidency. Not only did he win the presidency, but about four or five months after that, right? So they have separate presidential and national assembly elections in France, right? They vote on different days, right? His, his party, which didn't exist a year before that point in history, his party won a huge majority in the national assembly. And so you think, oh, well, if it can happen in France, of course it can happen in the United States. And so, right, you 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 might think that's the right answer, but but I hate to squash your dreams here, but no, because France has much different rules and regulations and how they count votes and and how people run for re-election than we do in the United States, right? So in France, there's it's it's partly based on PR. There's a national runoff, right? And so in the first round, there are five or six different parties, and then the two parties with the most votes go into a runoff. Right? We don't have that system in the United States. We have a the person with the most votes wins and the winner takes all, right? And so if you're talking about a third party, right, yeah, maybe, uh, right? If you're talking about a third party, it's just very hard to imagine under the rules in the United States. And let, let me just drive this home with a, with a really clear example. So for those of you that are reading the 19th page of the New York Times or right, even, even lower in the Houston Chronicle or Austin American Statesman or Dallas Morning News, Right. You might have heard that Andrew Yang has given up his membership in the Democratic Party. He's going to establish a new party. So imagine Andrew Yang ran for president as a Democrat. So we can think of his supporters as being uh, Democrats. So Andrew Yang decides to run for president in 2024. Joe Biden decides to run for president in 2024. And Donald Trump decides to run for president in 2024. For every single vote that Andrew Yang gets, that's a vote that Joe Biden isn't getting. So if we take away Joe Biden's vote total, we give it to Andrew Yang, who wins the presidency? Donald Trump, 
right? The way that our rules are set up in the United States is if you start supporting a third party, that the party that you like least is likely to do better. So if you want your least preferred party to win, then support a third party candidate. And, and I'm sorry for poo-pooing third parties, right? If, 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 if you want third parties to become successful in the United States, don't establish a third party, change the rules of the game. If we change the rules of the game, if we have some type of PR system, if we have some type of national runoff, if we have a party, if we have a system like Maine does, right? So Maine, even in their House of, uh, House of Representatives election, they have ranked choice voting. Right, so what ranked choice voting does is let's say there are four people running, let's say a far left, a far right, and then a moderate Democrat and a moderate Republican. You rank order those. And if no candidate has 50% of the vote, then they get rid of the person that has the least amount of votes. And all those people who voted for, for that as their preferred candidate, those are redistributed to their second place candidate. And then the vote totals are aggregated again. And if no one achieves 50%, then they take the person that got the least amount of votes again, and they re, uh, recalibrate all of those votes. And so even though the current Democratic House member in Maine uh, didn't get more votes than the Republican on election day, as soon as we do the ranked choice voting, they ended up with more. And so right, even those marginal reforms like that, then you can vote for your most preferred Right. And then second choice is the moderate Democrat or the moderate Republican. And then once those votes are re-aggregated, right, that type of, 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 of structure induces third parties rather than uh, rather than um, hinders third parties. And so it really matters uh, what the rules of the game are. In the United States, the rules of the game aren't great uh, for third parties. Great answer. Um, we only have just a few more minutes. So I'm going to ask some quick questions real quick. Um, how would you describe Trump's effect on driving both parties to vote? Oh, right. There were 70 percent of us voted in 2020, right? Half of us were doing it because we were just thrilled at the prospect of Donald Trump winning another term. And right, I suspect there are some few hardcore like Joe Biden voters that were thrilled to be voting for Joe Biden. I suspect, though, that they, are, that they were greatly outnumbered by those people who were so horrified at Donald Trump getting a second term uh, that they they were compelled to vote, right? And so what we saw in 2020 was voting off the charts, right? You even saw that in 2018, right? About 20% more people voted in 2018 than did vote four years early in the midterm elections. So there's no doubt that that Donald Trump like has has increased people's propensity for voting, right? And I dare say, right, Donald Trump is the reason I'm in, in France right? Donald Trump made American politics far more interesting to the rest of the world. I didn't get this invitation to come to France before Donald Trump, but they're like, all right, so you need to explain to us what's going on in the United States. How does Donald Trump end up becoming president? And so, right, France is more interested. It turns out American voters are more interested and we're voting at much greater rates because of, of Donald Trump's existence in our politics. Well, there was a lot of talk about foreign interference in the last election. What do you think about foreign interference in 2022? Is that a um, I mean, there are lots of talks, but what we know is that 2020 election is just clean as a whistle, right? When you have 70% of Americans, of course, there are going to be blips along the way. Of course, we're always going to be, be able to point like, hey, over there, that thing happened over there, that thing happened. But what we know is the 2020 election was was just was just right. It was it was the safest. It was the most secure election that we've had in, in a generation in the United States. But Right. Remember that we were in COVID. And so it's true that some of the states were changing their laws to take account of a pandemic. Right. And so it's true that states were changing their laws. Right. Democratic states were doing that. Republican states were doing that. States with split control were doing that. Right. Everyone was trying to create a safer voting system. Um, but what we know is that, right, that the foreign interference was 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 tiny. Um, if at all, right? I mean, there might have been some persuasion on Facebook and some of that stuff, but what we know is the 2020 election was just clean. And so we we can only hope uh, that the 2022 election is as clean. And if we do, then then I think that we ought to have as great of confidence in the results in 2022 as we do in the 2020 results. One last question. Um, why has the Democratic Party not tried harder to control the redistricting, redistricting in more states. That's a hard word. <laughs> yeah, no, you just were uh, right. The reason the Democrats can't right, they didn't win the they didn't win the election in 2020, right? So if they had if they had enough members in these state legislatures, remember we were talking about the potential of Democrats winning a majority in the state house in Texas, right? That didn't happen. 
When that didn't happen, Democrats lost their seat at the table at trying to create district lines. And so now what Democrats are going to try and do is put it through the court system and making sure that that these state legislatures are abiding by our existing laws, right? They're going to challenge, right, the delusion of, of Hispanic and African-American voters. They're going to try everything in their power to create more hospitable lines for Democratic candidates. But when you don't have the seats in the state legislatures that are redrawing the lines, then there's not much you can do. Um, and so right now, uh, we're, we're just seeing uh, what, what's going to happen and what how the court system and, and some of those cases are going to play out here over the course of the next couple of months. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Theriot, for speaking with us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us, especially from France, and for giving us many things to think about and consider for the 2022 midterm elections. And speaking of politics, as our executive director, Chuck Harris, mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, October 26th, is our annual advocacy event, Longhorns on the Hill. We hope you can join us virtually to meet with Congress members and share the impact of your UT Austin education. Learn more and register today at texasexas.org slash L-O-T-H. And on Wednesday, November 17th, Dr. Adam Rabinowitz will be discussing the Planet Texas 2020 initiatives at our November lunchtime lecture. You can register for that event now at texasexas.org slash lunchtime lectures. And we hope to see you there. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We had a great audience and we really appreciate your time and have a wonderful week.